Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the Clinical Case Review live stream event. The Clinical Case Review is a monthly live stream program that takes place on the second Wednesday of the month at noon. The series provides a review of clinical cases followed by discussion. Please enter your questions for our speaker today in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We will discuss questions at the conclusion of the presentation. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rachel Hart. She's a board certified geriatrician with specialized training in memory care. She's originally from Glendale, Kentucky and attended the University of Louisville for her, under, her undergraduate. She graduated from medical school at the Ohio University Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine. She completed her internal medicine residency at the Christ Hospital in Cincinnati, then completed her geriatric fellowship at the University of Cincinnati Christ Hospital program. As a geriatrician, she has training in caring for older adults in the settings of outpatient geriatric settings um, and inpatient consults, geriatric rehab, long-term care, and geriatric house calls. With that, I'll turn the program over to Dr. Hart, and I appreciate everyone joining today. Hello, thank you for joining us. I'm Dr. Hart. So let me get this pulled up here. All right, perfect. Um, I'm glad to be here today just to share some information on diagnosing dementia in the primary care office. Um, first of all, I have no disclosures. Um, and second of all, just to kind of review some objectives I wanna to cover today. First of all, identifying why cognitive screening is important in the primary care office, understand how to make a diagnosis of dementia, utilize cognitive screening tools of the mini mental status exam, St. Louis mental status exam, and the Montreal cognitive assessment, list our memory enhancing medications used to treat Alzheimer's disease, and then last of all, to know when and to whom to make a referral for your patients. So looking at dementia by the numbers, dementia is not a normal part of aging, but it does occur more frequently with increasing age. About 1% of people have dementia in their 60s, and that prevalence will double every five years. So that by the time patients reach their 90s, about 40% of people will have a dementia. And at this time, there's over 6 million people in the United States that live with a dementia illness. However, providers identify dementia in less than 50% of patients. So if we look at the definition of dementia according to DSM, it's evidence of cognitive decline from a previous level of performance in one or more cognitive domains, either complex attention, executive function, learning and memory, language, perceptual motor, social cognition, um, and it's based on concerns from an individual patient and informant, such as a caregiver or a clinician. There has to be substantial impairment in cognitive performance, preferably that can be seen on a cognitive, um, neuro, standard neurocognitive testing. So those cognitive deficits interfere with either instrumental activities of daily living. Um, they cannot occur exclusively in the context of a delirium and they are not explained better by a mental disorder such as major depression or schizophrenia. And I think a more simple way to look at this is that dementia really means that there's cognitive impairment that leads then to functional impairment. So because of someone's memory loss, they also are having loss of independence in their instrumental activities of daily living and or their loss of independence in activities of daily living. So some of the things that a patient and oftentimes family members will come to the clinic describing is that a patient is going to have difficulty completing everyday tasks. They may become lost in familiar places, such as trying to drive um, to someone's home or maybe a primary care physician who they've seen for many years. They're forgetful of recent events, maybe people or people's names. They have difficulty with word finding or communication. They can become unaware of time and place, and then often there's changes in mood or behavior, such as increased anxiety, increased irritability, or frustration. So there are a lot of types of dementia. If we think of dementia in general, that just means the cognitive impairment that causes that functional impairment. Overall, Alzheimer's disease is our most common subtype, followed by vascular dementia, 
and then mixed Alzheimer's and vascular pathology. And then some of the more rare types of dementia will be dementia with Lewy bodies, frontotemporal dementia, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease. There are toxic metabolic types of dementia often caused by um, medical conditions, hypoxia, porphyria, um, vitamin deficiencies. Um, and then there are also our rapidly progressive dementias such as um, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. Um, for this presentation, we'll focus mostly on the Alzheimer's disease. So how we diagnose dementia really comes down to doing a cognitive screening test and getting a history to look at a significant cognitive dysfunction. Typically, patients who have dementia will also have symptoms of aphasia, meaning language problems. It can be um, problems finding words or difficulty naming objects. They might have apraxia, which is an inability to perform something that was previously routine such as combing your hair, maybe using a cell phone. Their hands have the motor skills to complete those tasks, but the brain can't tell the hands what to do. They may have agnosia, which is an inability to recognize previous familiar items or previously familiar people, or they may have a decrease in executive function or the ability to plan and organize. And last of all, you need to exclude any reversible cause of this cognitive impairment. So one question that I had just for the audience to think about is what tests should we be including in all of our medical evaluations for memory loss? Urinalysis of vitamin B12 and thyroid, syphilis, brain imaging, um, B and D or F, all of the above. And then the answer is really vitamin B12, thyroid, and brain imaging. So kind of a clinical pearl to think about is that the medical workup for memory loss typically will include routine labs, a metabolic panel, a blood count, and then everybody should have a vitamin B12, a thyroid test, and then some kind of brain imaging. Other tests should really be guided by our clinical history or suspicion. So some of the things you might consider maybe in a younger patient, um, if there is history that you can, are concerned about sexually transmitted diseases, you may think about an HIV or syphilis serology. Um, if somebody has some kind of exposure that you worry about through work, you might do a heavy metal assay. Um, or if somebody has a rapidly progression of dementia, you may consider things like a lumbar puncture. So our cognitive screening tests, there are several. Um, probably the three most common are the ones that I selected for this. Um, the first one to think about is something called a mini mental status exam. And this is a test that scored out of 30 points um, and asks, it's a, a good questionnaire for patients who have at least a high school education. Um, for those patients who have a higher level of education, um, it is not a great screening test because we can have a lot of cognitive impairment issues that are missed on this. Um, but typically, um, there are cutoffs that have been established for interpreting. A single cutoff less than 24 should be considered abnormal. And then if we look at people who have um, their level of education, um, if somebody's got a college degree, um, less than 24, less than a high school education, less than 23, and if they have an eighth grade education, um, 21 should really be considered a cutoff for impairment. Um, it is a good test that looks at as far as uh, moderate to severe dementia. If someone scores less than a 17, um, it's pretty clear that they have a severe cognitive impairment. We also have a St. Louis mental status exam. Um, this test, um, a little different from the mini mental status exam, includes some other cognitive domains including some questions about visual spatial skills and executive function. Um, and it also puts more weight on memory questions. So instead of having three points for memory, this one actually has eight. It also has an interpretation score um, that varies based on either high school education or college. Um, for those who have dementia, um, less than a high school degree, um, anything less than 19 is considered a significant score and probably impaired into a dementia range. Versus those who have a high school education, your cutoff is gonna be a 20. Now, both the mini mental status exam and 
um, a St. Louis mental status exam probably takes about seven to 10 minutes for most patients. And then the other test to think about is something called a Montreal Cognitive Assessment or a MOCA. Um, the limitation with the MOCA in a primary care setting is probably going to be time. Most patients take about 15 minutes to complete this one. Um, but it does have a more broad um, picture of the cognitive domains that we want to assess. It includes executive function, memory, attention, abstract thinking, um, and language. Um, on this one, there's also cutoffs um, pretty much across the board. Less than 10 is going to indicate a severe level of dementia or severe cognitive impairment. Those who score from a 10 to 17, probably a moderate range of dementia. Um, this one is going to be a more appropriate screening test for patients who have a higher level of education. Say if you have someone who um, has gone through college, may have a master's degree, may be a physician, a retired attorney. Um, higher levels of education, this would be a more appropriate screening tool. And then another thing to think about is that not every patient needs to go through an intense neuropsychology testing. Um, the reason the cognitive screening tests exist is really to help us um, either confirm a diagnosis or to um, help us um, try to figure out is, is more testing needed or can we base a diagnosis of dementia on a memory screening test and a clinical history and a medical evaluation. Neuropsychology testing really is more helpful when we suspect another type of dementia other than Alzheimer's disease, if someone has a young onset dementia or if there's something that um, a memory specialist is concerned about, they may have specific things that we're looking for on this neuropsychology test. So how do we assess for functional decline? So for patients that we're thinking about instrumental activities of daily living, those are gonna be more complex tasks that require higher levels of thinking, completing a job, um, shopping, cooking, finances, managing medicines and driving versus activities of daily living are gonna be more things involved with um, controlling our hygiene taking a bath, toileting, eating, um, dressing ourselves, bathing, typically tasks that require much less planning. Um, and not surprising, earlier stages of dementia will present with difficulty with instrumental activities of daily living versus our patients who have a moderate stage or later are gonna ha be having problems with activities of daily living as well. So at this point, there are not any medications that um, unfortunately reverse or cure dementias, but there are pharmacologic medications available. And these drugs are really put into a class called memory enhancing medications. What they've been shown to be helpful for more than anything is that they may help slow the progression of memory loss. So if patients start them in the earlier stage, they can stay in an earlier stage of dementia for a longer time. Something that can be helpful for patients, especially if it helps maintain them um, being able to stay at home for a longer time. But I think it is important to educate patients and their caregivers that our expectations with these medications, we're looking at the long-term benefit, um, as opposed to when you take these medications, you're still going to have memory loss. There shouldn't be an expectation that the memory loss will go away. Um, but the treatments that we have are four drugs. Three of them are in the class called cholinesterase inhibitors that increase the level of acetylcholine available in the brain. And those are denepazil, rivastigmine, and galantamine. And then our fourth drug is an NMDA receptor antagonist um, called memantine that increases the level of glutamate available in the brain. And one thing to note, um, all of these have equal um, roughly equal effectiveness. It's okay to start any of these medications. Um, it's not recommended that you would use more than one cholinesterase inhibitor. They've not been shown to be more effective when we use multiple drugs from the same class, but they do have higher risks for causing side effects. And then the other type of medications we will use in dementia are generally going to be behavioral modifying medications. So those might be something like antidepressants to control symptoms like anxiety, irritability, antipsychotics we'll use if we're trying to control symptoms specifically of delusions, paranoia, or hallucinations. And then mood stabilizers are going to be medications we may be using more for people who may have some um, symptoms like self-harm or 
um, physical agitation um, that put caregivers at risk. So I wanted to go through a few cases here. Um, and our first case is a 76-year-old male who presented to the office with a history of confusion and kind of bizarre behavior. His wife reported that he's had short-term memory loss um, over the last few years, but significantly worse than maybe two to three months. And she's most concerned about some atypical behaviors. He's been having conversations with the deceased brother. He's packed up his truck. Um, with food and firearms, almost as if there's going to be an apocalypse, um, and then drove through the neighborhood trying to find his family farm in Adair County where he grew up. He's obsessed with keys and he's made multiple keys to the front door and then loses the key and calls a locksmith because he can't find it. Um, he's also been trying to get his neighbor to do things for him for large amounts of money, such as, can you give me a ride and I'll pay you $100. So his past medical history does have hypertension, hyperlipidemia, he has AFib, and he also has hypothyroidism. Um, his medications all seem appropriate. He's on amiodarone, amlodipine, apixaban, atorvastatin, levothyroxine, and metoprolol. When he's in the office, he does complete a MOCA and he scores an 18 out of 30, um, which is a lower score. Um, anything under 26 on a MOCA is considered um, significant. So we did some medical workup. He had a medical uh, complete, metabolic, molic, complete metabolic panel that was notable for some chronic kidney disease. His vitamin B12 was normal and his TSH was actually greater than 100. And then he did have a CT of his head um, and that showed a chronic left corona radiata lacunar infarct um, that was actually found incidentally. Um, once the scan was done, he had never had any symptoms that the family had thought he'd had a stroke from. Um, and then he also had a finding of mild microangiopathy, um, which we also will call mild chronic small vessel ischemic disease. So I wanted to put a slide on here um, that looks at how we rate chronic small vessel ischemic disease. Um, anytime you get an MRI scan or a CAT scan for an older adult over 75, there's going to be a good chance of finding some of this. And there are rating scales that look at how severe the small vessel disease is. And broad picture, we look at mild, moderate, and severe. And looking through these scans, it's pretty easy to see the severe stage. We have a lot of white areas, hyperdensities that um, indicate much more of this small vessel ischemic disease. For somebody who's 75 who may have been a history of a smoker, they may have diabetes, coronary disease, um, 75, we would expect to see mild level of chronic small vessel ischemic disease. It's probably not going to be the cause of a lot of memory impairment for people. Versus somebody who's got severe ischemic disease um, and they're coming in with a MOCA of a 15 and they have symptoms of dementia, if we have a scan like this third scan on the right, it's probably indicating that vascular disease is their most common type of dementia. So that being said, him having mild chronic small vessel disease on a scan didn't really make me think that he had vascular dementia. I was expecting that was more of a finding based on his medical history. But for him, the bigger problem was his thyroid. Um, and on talking to him and his wife, um, he had not been taking his thyroid medication consistently, largely because he hadn't been educated that his levothyroxine needed to be taken on an empty stomach. Um, so he was taking it in the afternoon with other medications or other nights he would take it with his night medication right before bed. Um, so after giving him and his wife some education on how to take his levothyroxine, um, he had his um, follow-up eight weeks later, had a, cat, a TSH repeated that was now normal, and his reckless behavior had resolved. Um, he did still have some short-term memory loss, but his MOCA improved, um, and he probably now has more of what we would call a mild cognitive impairment, um, but he was able to return to um, normal behaviors, um, was driving um, normally, was able to um, retake over his medications after his thyroid resolved. And I think this is a good case to think about how a primary care physician is going to be usually the first person that someone, um, either a patient or a caregiver, will alert, we have memory problems. Um, the primary care physician will hear of it first, 
And a lot of times why we do a medical workup is because of this patient, because we find something that can be treatable and we can make a big improvement in their memory. Our second case is a 72-year-old man who presented to the clinic with a complaint of memory loss. He'd recently retired and, he's not, and he has now noticed he's been more forgetful, forgets names, forgets events of the day before, and he and his wife are reporting he still functions well. He's still driving, um, including they just got back from a trip to Florida um, for two weeks ago, and he drove the camper there and back. He drove in Florida. Um, he still manages his own medications, and he also manages the finances for the couple. So not really noting any functional impairment, just some forgetfulness of names. So his only past medical history is hypertension. His only prescription medication is lisinopril. But when we do his many mental status exam, um, and we chose many mental status exam because he's a high school graduate, um, it was only a 22. So less than 24 is something that could be of concern. Um, so we did a workup. His lab showed that his metabolic panel was normal. His thyroid was 0.98. Vitamin B12 was normal at 728. And his MRI brain was really unremarkable. There was no evidence of any prior diseases, like any strokes. Um, he had some age-related mild diffuse atrophy, um, but really nothing else on a, an MRI scan of concern. But as we were talking, um, we found out that um, even though he did not list it on his prescription medications, he's been consistently taking Benadryl 50 milligrams every night for sleep for several months. And so then the second question to just kind of consider is what classes of medications can affect cognition? Are they benzodiazepines, antipsychotics, anticholinergics, or narcotics? Or is it all of the above? And really for this case, um, all of the above medications can cause problems with memory impairment. Um, the medication classes that we worry the most about are gonna be anticholinergics and benzodiazepines. These classes of medications have been shown that um, to be the most likely if we're taking them long-term that those are the medications that can impact memory. Um, commonly prescribed medications, um, I would say the most common ones that I see that we end up discontinuing um, that have been a problem for patients are going to be diphenhydramine, hydroxazine, oxybutynin, and dicyclamine. And for a lot of these medications, um, patients have been able to find alternatives or we realized we didn't need to take some of them. So for this patient, um, diphenhydramine, again, is a strong anticholinergic and it's associated with causing worsening memory loss. So it was discontinued. He improved his sleep hygiene by decreasing his caffeine intake and just using melatonin about once a week for days he could, for days he could not sleep. He returned about four months later. His MMSE had improved to a 29 out of 30. The only point that he missed um, was the date, and he was off by one day, um, the 13th versus the 14th of the month. Um, but he and his wife had reported that his, res his memory loss had really resolved. Um, so for him, his diagnosis really ended up being polypharmacy. So nothing to indicate a dementia for him. But again, I think his case is important to think about um, those reversible causes and what we can do to help patients with memory. And then case three is a 63-year-old man who presented to the clinic with a history of being repetitive. He's having a difficult time organizing, a hard time focusing, and his primary care physician had diagnosed him with likely ADHD about six months prior. He would never had a diagnosis of ADHD before this um, and really didn't have a history of inattention as a young adult or as a child. Um, when he came into the office, though, his MMSC was a 24. Um, and this was a screening test um, that our uh, medical assistant had administered, um, but of note for him, um, his education background is actually a PhD. Um, so for somebody who's got greater than a college education, an MMSE of 24 is something to be concerned about. Um, 
on talking with his wife, we also found out that in the last year, um, she has noticed more that he's having difficulty keeping up with the tasks for his job. Um, he's relying on an assistant to come to meetings with him um, to make sure that he has the directions, he knows what to do for follow-up. He's having difficulty remembering appointments, um, both for work, for family, and for physician visits. And he's also needing reminders to take his medications. So his past medical history, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. Um, he's got a medication list of diltiazem, 240, and pravastatin. So both of those appropriate. Um, we did a MOCA and he scored a 15 out of 30. His thyroid was normal, his vitamin B12 was normal, but his MRI of his brain showed that he'd had some mild generalized cerebral atrophy, and that's going to be something that would be expected with age. It's a mild chronic small vessel disease, and he has a chronic left basal ganglia infarct. Um, but more significantly, he had something called a punctate foci of gradient susceptibility artifact within the cerebral and cerebellar hemispheres. And the radiologist said that this is seen with cerebral amyloid angiopathy. And so if we look at an MRI scan, the finding of the cerebral amyloid angiopathy are really what we're looking at with these small dark areas. Um, and those areas are actually micro hemorrhages. And amyloid angiopathy is a type of cerebrovascular disorder. It's characterized by the amyloid beta that actually accumulates within the small vessels or the capillaries of the brain. It causes some tiny hemorrhages in the brain and it is something that can be associated with Alzheimer's disease. So this gentleman does meet criteria for early stage of dementia. He has impaired cognition with a memory test, his MOCA 15, and he also has the history of the functional decline in his IEDLs. Um, his MRI brain scan also has a specific finding for Alzheimer's disease, and he has vascular disease apparent from that small vessel disease and from that prior stroke. Um, again, something that was found incidentally on an MRI, but did not have symptoms of a stroke prior to this. Um, so for him, um, he is appropriate for memory enhancing medications, and he was started on Dinepazil. And then our fourth case is a 67-year-old man who presented to the clinic with memory loss and behavioral changes that have been progressive over several years. He's making poor decisions, especially about his finances. He's lost his wallet on more than one occasion. Um, he's gone on spending sprees. Um, once when he lost his wallet, the Bank of America called um, to alert him of someone else spending money on his card, and he thought that someone was playing a joke on him. Um, he then gave away $1,000 um, and more money was taken from his account. He's had three car accidents in the last six months um, for reckless driving. His behavior is also very inappropriate. His wife has caught him watching pornography late at night, um, and he's been calling their daughter by racial slurs, um, something that he had never done prior so his past medical history, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and osteoarthritis. So medications all seem appropriate, amlodipine, atorvastatin, carvedilol, hydralazine, naproxen, pravastatin, and tramadol as needed. And then when we did an evaluation for him, his mini mental status exam was a 23. Um, his metabolic panel, um, normal, blood count was normal, B12 and thyroid were also normal. His MRI brain showed a chronic infarct within the left cerebellar hemisphere. Um, again, another incidental finding, he did not report a history of a stroke, nor did his wife. Um, but interestingly for this patient, um, he'd had symptoms of memory loss and inappropriate behavior for several years. Um, during the pandemic, his primary care physician had made a referral to neuropsychology, and he'd had testing done um, and the test profile was concerning for a developing frontotemporal lobe dementia. So some things to note on the frontotemporal dementia um, is that it is a diagnosis that um, we look at as um, a probable or possible frontotemporal dementia and a probable. Based on the diagnostic criteria, 
um, that was developed, people who have a frontal lobe dementia um, will have three of the following. Early behavioral disinhibition, apathy or inertia, so kind of a lack of interest in activities or a lack of ability um, to complete activities, early loss of sympathy or empathy, um, early perseverative, stereotyped or compulsive ritualistic behavior, hyperorality, where everything is put into their mouth and dietary changes, and a neuropsychology profile that shows executive dysfunction um, with relative sparing of memory and visual spatial skills. So when these patients do their neuropsychology testing, um, most of the problem that they will have will be executive dysfunction and attention. Um, so problem solving, um, processing speed, switching between tasks. But for the most part, they're not amnestic like someone with Alzheimer's disease will have, um, and their working memory, auditory or visual memory really might be very normal. So if a patient has three of those criteria, they already meet criteria for a possible frontotemporal dementia. What changes it to a probable behavioral variant FTD um, is brain imaging. And so with an MRI scan, we'll often see the frontal and or the anterior temporal lobe that's atrophied out of proportion to the rest of the brain. Um, and sometimes if someone gets a PET scan, um, they'll have meta um, hypometabolism or hypoperfusion in those same areas of the brain. And more commonly, people will have a MRI scan done as a part of a clinical workup than a PET scan. But on this image on the left, you can see on his flare image, um, his frontal lobe is very atrophied compared to the rest of the brain. So for this patient, um, even though, you know, if you think back about his workup and testing he'd had done, even a year prior to being seen in the memory clinic, you could have made a diagnosis of frontotemporal dementia. But what I think the clinic offered, um, our memory clinic offered more was that he really needed help to confirm a diagnosis, provide education um, to his wife about the disease, um, and then also talk about treatment. Unfortunately, with um, frontotemporal dementias, there are no medications that provide a cure, and even our memory-enhancing medicines that we use with Alzheimer's disease um, have not been shown to have a large benefit for people. Um, sometimes we'll talk about a trial, maybe about six to 12 months to see, is it something that's showing some stability and symptoms? Um, but overall, um, most patients don't have a long-term benefit from it. Um, his wife did wish to try it, so it was tried. Um, but the, the bigger thing that comes with treatment for these patients is really management of their behavioral manage or behavioral symptoms. Um, and our psychiatric um, nurse practitioner was a big help with that. Um, most people with behavioral variant FTD end up on some kind of um, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor to help with mood swings. Um, and he really needed um, a low dose of quetiapine to help with some delusional behaviors too. And then a big part of um, helping this patient really was ending up um, helping his wife, who is his main caregiver. Um, so she's been involved with our caregiver support group um, and has frequent discussions um, with a physician or nurse practitioner and our social worker. Um, he now no longer drives. Um, we've had the guns removed in the home and multiple other safety issues have been managed too. Um, so I did go ahead and put this slide on. Um, you know, for the most part, a lot of people with Alzheimer's disease are going to be seen first by primary care physicians. And sometimes those patients with Alzheimer's may never get to a memory center. Um, if they have treatment, um, if their family can provide good support, um, if their other medical conditions are um, managed well, they, they may never have a referral to us and that's fine. We're happy to see anybody that, that um, is referred to us, but a lot of Alzheimer's disease patients just by sheer number will be managed by a primary care physician. Um, but I do think that there are certain patients that regardless of a comfort level of, of a primary care physician taking care of or managing, they can still benefit from a memory care specialist. Um, one, especially if you're not sure about the diagnosis of dementia, they should always be referred. Um, our more rare types of dementias, um, this presentation primarily focused on Alzheimer's disease, but for those who have more rare types, frontotemporal dementia or Lewy body disease or rapidly progressive dementia, 
those are good people to send to a memory specialist. Um, and a lot of times, um, especially for FTD and Lewy body disease, it may not just be for memory treatment, but um, patients and caregivers often need help with managing um, behavioral symptoms as well. Um, also, if a family or caregiver needs dementia education or assistance with community resources, so it's just social worker support um, or finding resources in the community, such as adult day programs um, or agencies that can assist with placement into memory care. And then always if somebody has neuropsychiatric symptoms, um, hallucinations, delusions, paranoia, anger, anxiety, those are all challenging symptoms um, and often require specialists to help with that management. And then the last slide is just um, when to make a referral or how to make a referral. Um, the Norton Memory Center, um, you can just put a referral into our medical record, EMR, um, and you just want to put it in neurology memory so that it goes to the memory clinic. This is a website um, with more information about our memory center, and then my um, email is at the end. And that is everything I have. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you so much, Rachel. I, I really appreciate it. So um, I know there was a question um, and it was regarding your last case there with the um, frontotemporal dementia. And I my guess is it was an oversight on your slide, um, but that patient by your medication list was on two different statins, pravastatin oh. and torvastatin. Hmm. So, my guess is that it was just a probably an oversight. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit um, obsessive compulsive about um, manage or about going through medication lists, so I apologize on that. Yeah, no, no worries. I, I assumed that that was the case, and um, I imagine we're going to get um, several more questions as um, as we go through this. But I I have a couple for you. So um, for, for me and for a lot of us that have um, taken care of a lot of patients over the years, there's always the, the question of the difference between someone who's 60 and their ability to process all the busyness in their life and in their mind. And so there's some forgetfulness just because of the million thoughts that go through your mind and you remember 900,000 of them, there are still 100,000 that you forget. Um, versus an early sign of dementia. So is there, a, is there a good way for us to be prepared to think about that? I think that's where a cognitive screening test can be really helpful um, because there are a lot of things that can happen that we call age-related memory change. And those are things that people can have um, and they're going to be more worried about it and bring it up. But some of the things that I think are significant are if that 60 year old is still able to maintain a job, get to work every day, um, they make their to do list, they have um, the ability to um, tell you their symptoms, you know, I'm worried that I, I'm not multitasking the way that I used to be able to. Um, but during your interview, if it's somebody that you've known well, and you know you can go over their medical history, their medications, they show that they have a good understanding uh, of that, your suspicion for dementia should be really low. Versus somebody who's saying, you know, I have a hard time focusing, I have a hard time getting through job tasks. They come in with a caregiver and the caregiver gives me a letter from their, their work, their um, place of employment that says, hey, um, we're worried because this person can't figure out the computer system. We have a new computer system put in. He's really struggling. I'm not sure that he's going to be able to keep up with this. That's a little bit more of a significance, but that's where I think a memory screening test can be helpful because if you have a patient who's 60 and saying, you know, I just, I feel like my memory's starting to slip and they do a MOCA and they score a 29, that's likely not anything to be worried about. You do a MOCA and they score a 22, that's probably something significant. Yeah, and I think the classic, because I, I used to always get this question, and um, now at my age, I, I start having the same, <laughs> the same question, and that's that, you know, I go into the kitchen, and then once I get there, I've forgotten what I was going mm -hmm. in there for, and then have to really think, what was I doing? Oh, yeah, I, I was yeah. going in to get my bottle of water or whatever. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so those sorts of things where there's just so many things competing for your mm -hmm. attention that um, some of the things that are second nature kind of get. Yeah, um, and I think that's the, the big thing is that those are attention type of syndromes as opposed to memory loss. Um, and one of the things that I think we become very aware of as we get older is that our brain is not designed to be able to multitask, but we're able to, to fake that when we're younger. And part of that is because our brains move faster so we can complete one task and move on to the second. But when we get to be an older adult, age-related memory changes that there is a delay. And part of that is that, you know, if you think about living 70 years, lots of more things to keep up with than when you're 30 or 40, but it may take longer to recall somebody's name. It may take longer to um, you know, balance that checkbook than it did 10 years before. But now when we're older and we're taking longer to move from one step to another, we see that as I can't multitask, but really we can't do that at all and it, because it divides our attention. Okay, no, I, I think that's a good clarification. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, so we do have a few questions in the Q&A box that I'll go over. And if there's still time, I have a couple others for you. Um, but our audience is obviously takes precedence over me. Um, so would the death of a spouse cause an increase in dementia symptoms? Um, I will say yes, kind of with, with a caveat. Um, it, it, the, the death of a spouse doesn't necessarily um, make the dementia worse. Like it doesn't make somebody necessarily go from a mild to moderate stage of dementia but it does usually um, have one of two things happen. Oftentimes um, we get referrals for patients after the death of a spouse because the family, daughter, son, grandchild, who's ever taking care of them have now realized that that spouse has been managing those instrumental activities of daily living for a couple of years, probably have already had a dementia that had not gone, had gone undiagnosed because somebody else was managing it. Um, or the other thing is that when someone who does have dementia loses someone who's very close to them, we have an exacerbation of behavioral symptoms. So whether that's depression, more anxiety, or for more moderate stage dementia, those patients, when they lose someone, they may not be able to describe who it was that they lost, but they know something's wrong. So they're more likely to have those things like um, maybe some delusions looking for them. Um, thinking that somebody should be coming into the house when there's not there and um, rechecking the door lock several times. Um, or they may start having symptoms um, that we think about like incontinence, wetting the bed, things that we think about stress responses. So those will get worse after the death of a spouse. Yeah, I've sort of um, over the years seen those in sort of a two-pronged fashion. So one, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, that there already was dementia there, but they were a team and they worked well together. And so nobody really noticed it. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other is that due to the sort of depressive symptoms that you can get from the grief and the loss of a spouse, that mm -hmm. that apathy and inattention and all of that is just part of that grief process. Mm -hmm. And so six months, a year later, they really have perked back up to a relatively normal functioning Right. And may still have some grief, but that, that initial shock of the, the grief and mm -hmm. the depressive symptoms have gotten better. Yep. Um, so another question, um, you mentioned the MMSE and MOCA more than slums. Is there a deficiency in using the slums? Um, there's not a deficiency. There's actually a lot of debate um, within memory providers on what is a good screening test. The mini mental status exam um, is the preferred test for most clinical trials. So if you're in drug trials or in research, um, almost all of those patients have a mini mental status exam. Um, and that's why a lot of, um, I think memory providers will argue using them because if you look at studies that looked at some of these newer drugs that are um, potentially on the horizon or even things like the um, Nemenda and Aricept, they were looking at um, outcomes based on a score on an MMSC. Um, the MMSC now does have a patent, um, so we're really not supposed to be using it, um, and that's why a lot of health systems, including Norton, like if you're in the hospital here and speech therapy does a cognitive screening, they'll use a St. Louis mental status exam. Um, the VA uses only exclusively the St. Louis mental status exam. Um, there's not a direct conversion between the MMSC and a, and a slum, so if you take, say you get a 21 on an MMSC, 
it doesn't tell me that you'll get a 21 on a slums. Um, the MOCA was designed um, really to help pick up those patients who might have a mild cognitive impairment or a pre-dementia, or maybe if they have a dementia that's um, an earlier stage, it is going to have a higher specificity, mainly because of the executive function it includes. Um, the MOCA has a conversion scale, so if you score a, um, a you have a test score from an MMSC, it's roughly five points less on a MOCA. So um, some studies, some drug trials will use both of those as markers for their cognition. Uh, most people, I think, clinically prefer a MOCA because it's the most specific. It has the highest sensitivity and specificity both, but it's just not practical for a lot of people who have shorter office visits. The St. Louis Mental Status Exam um, does have a lot of things in it that are very helpful. Um, I think for the patients that I've used it on um, from you know, other offices or other hospitals may have had a slums and I've done a MOCA, they tend to have closer, um, closer test scores together than a MOCA and an MMSC when we compare those. Um, but the slums also has um, some executive function that's listed on it um, with the clock draw test and then also um, with some animal fluency or some language fluency. So it has a higher specificity actually than an MMSE. Um, so there's nothing against the slums, the MMSE or the MOCA. It really depends on what's the one that you're the most comfortable with, um, being able to administer it and then being able to repeat that test maybe six months or a year later to really look at longitudinally what's happening to that score. So um, I, I thought when um, I was first introduced to the slums that it did a better job than the MMSE for people with a higher education. Is that not correct? Um, I think it's arguable. Um, I, I think that's what, what I've seen um, clinically, like what I've seen anecdotally, but I don't know that in the, the research it was actually saying that it was more specific for it. Um, because even when you break down the test scores, whether you have high school or less than high school, there's not, um, there's not a cutoff for those people who have a college degree. So it didn't factor that in. Okay. And then what is the um, rough um, length of time? Um, so I know you said, and I think we've all done enough MMSEs to know the general length of time, but um, slums and MOCA, what are the... And the MMSC usually takes about seven to 10 minutes. Um, a slums usually takes about 10, and then a MOCA is at least 15. Okay. Um, the, the other thing too is that the MMSC and the St. Louis Mental Status Exam, I think, are easier for patients to complete if they have a moderate stage dementia. So if you have somebody, like I mean, primary care physicians may know somebody for years and they may have, um, or they may get a, a brand new patient with a family, and if they have suspicion already strongly that this patient is pretty cognitively impaired, a MOCA thinking it's gonna take 15 minutes is gonna be unrealistic. Somebody who has moderate dementia, if you wanna get through it, 20, 25 minutes is not, is not unexpected. And that's probably not feasible for a primary care setting either. Okay. Um, so question on um, Don Epizil. So with the dosing, the there's five and 10 and then the 23. Um, so mm -hmm. what's, what's the use for the 23 that's sort of an odd dosing? Yeah, it's sort of, um, a, it's really just a pharmaceutical ploy. Um, fives and tens have been around for a long time. Um, the 23, I think, came out, I think, when I was a resident. Um, so it's been 12, 12 years or so ago. Um, and it really didn't take off because there, there wasn't really any direct there wasn't a, a study or any evidence behind if you increase from a 10 to a 23 that it helped improve their memory. Um, when they looked at memory enhancing medicines with denepazil fives and tens, there was a modest benefit with increasing it to a 10. That wasn't shown with the 23, but what happened more often on those studies and then what we see clinically, when you double up that dose of denepazil, patients end up unable to tolerate it because of chronic diarrhea. Um, so because Clinically, and then um, research-wise, we saw that all we got was side effects of more diarrhea. Most of the time, we don't increase the Aricept over 10. It is available. Um, it is also something that still costs significantly more for most patients than if they're on a 5 or 10 dose from their insurance. Okay. 
Um, so what about this age questions? Is um, that useful as a screen? Um, I'm assuming it's talking about the self-administered gerocognitive exam. Yes. Okay. Um, so the couple things with the, the SAGE, um, it's not used very often um, for a few reasons. And one of it, I, I think it came out maybe in 2009 or 2010, um, came from Ohio State University. I know their memory clinic uses it. Most of the data that we have published about it um, is just being used at that memory center. We don't have it used a lot of other places. A um, couple things that are kind of questionable about it. Um, when you self-administer a test, um, there are a couple things that you can't see. Like it's helpful for me to watch a patient take a MOCA because I can see them struggling and I can see how long it takes them to do something. I'm already seeing executive dysfunction. When you don't see that, when a patient's taking um, and or taking a self-administered exam, I think one that that takes away some of your clinical suspicion. Um, two is that when it's self-administered, sometimes patients actually take these exams at home and then bring them back into the office. And then you can't factor out, well, did they do this test on their own? Did they have help or not? Um, so it's not a controlled environment. And then the, the third thing is actually the SAGE test. Um, there's only one question about memory on the whole exam. Um, and it actually is just, your first question is, please remember to um, write at the end, I am finished on your last page of the test, but that's the only memory question. The rest of it is based on orientation. Um, you have some visual spatial skills and executive function. Um, so the SAGE, I, I don't think we know exactly what to do with it clinically. There are some studies that look at longitudinally. I think it helps if, you're, if you know somebody has a mild cognitive impairment or a dementia, and you track them with the SAGE test, so you'll see that decline in test score over time, so you know their dementia is worsening. But is it more helpful or is it as helpful um, when you're trying to make a diagnosis of dementia that's not really been shown yet? Thank you. Um, so this is sort of a two-parter. Um, we have a question. Um, someone's asking that they thought that there was a cost to using um, and scoring the MOCA and sort of a codicil to that is in late June of 2019, we learned that the MOCA um, would become proprietary in September and users um, must be trained and certified for a fee of $125 and recertify every two years. Yeah, I think the first year it came out, it was 100 and then it moved to 125. Um, and so I, I will say, yes, that exists. Um, the, the people or the, I guess the agency that created the MOCA um, is now recommending that providers, if you're going to administer it, that you do an online training session to be certified, to complete it, and then to use it. Um, you have to pay for the certification, but the test itself um, is not patented where you have to use it, uh, where you actually have to pay for it. Um, the MMSC does have a patent, so technically, if you're going to be administering it, you're supposed to be paying a fee um, for every test that you administer. Um, that one actually does not, um, it, there's no way of actually enforcing that, so a lot of hospitals, a lot of systems, including a lot of um, systems that are a part of research studies, don't actually pay that fee. Um, so the MOCA there, if you want a certification so that you are trained in how to administer it. Yes, there's a fee involved with that, um, but you can use the test even if you don't have the certification. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. So um, next question, at what stage do you consider stopping the memory medicines? Um, so I think two things to kind of think about, definitely um, for patients who have an end-stage dementia, um, when you know, if we think about end-stage disease, people who um, are no longer eating, difficulty swallowing medications, um, bed-bound, um, when we think that life expectancy is probably a year or less, I think it's a good idea to consider stopping those medications just the same as we start minimizing other medications for them. Um, and then the other thing is that if we're thinking about these medications as disease slowing or modifying, you want to be able to to track this patient with a memory test over time. So for me, it's also meaningful, say I see somebody 
Clinically, they have early stage dementia. Their MOCA is a 23. Six months later, their MOCA is a 19. Six months after that, their MOCA is a 12. I don't really have any objective evidence that that medication is helping. And if you're not noticing a stability or a change in the medicine or with the medicine there, I think it's worthwhile to have a discussion of stopping it, maybe starting an alternative treatment. Um, and the other thing is that um, if somebody has side effects where they can't tolerate it, these medications are not curative. So if they are, all they're doing is staying in the bathroom because they're having four or five, 10 episodes of diarrhea a day, if they really can't tolerate it, it needs to be stopped. Okay. Um, and what about patients who, um, who have dementia that refuse to stop driving? Um, so that's that can be a whole presentation in and of itself. Mm -hmm. um, and part of it comes to, you know, as clinicians, our job is really to educate family and then to report to um, the appropriate services in Kentucky and Indiana. There's um, forms that you complete um, in Kentucky. It's called a driving affidavit. And then in Indiana, I believe it's just a letter that you submit to the BMV. Um, and you identify yourself as a physician, um, advanced practice provider, seeing a patient. Um, I have concerns because this patient has Alzheimer's disease. Um, I request that they be tested further to, about, to allow them to continue to drive. Once that affidavit is submitted in Kentucky, um, our um, Bureau of Transportation actually has a medical committee that reviews those. And then they'll send out another letter for or another form for the physician to complete, including um, you know, what concerns have happened, what medications they're on. Um, and then it asks for your opinion on should this patient be allowed to continue to drive or should we require them to do some kind of driving assessment. Um, and the state generally will require a driving assessment. Um, if the driving assessment is failed, um, the patient has, I, I wanna say 60 days um, first to schedule the driving assessment from the time that they receive that letter. If they fail to do so, the state can revoke their license or if they fail the driving test, they can revoke the license. Um, but the, the other thing is that um, we really need to educate caregivers on if driving is not safe, um, a lot of burden has to be taken on the caregiver as far as removing the keys or removing the car from the premises too. Um, is there anything that you could um, recommend for the patient's family to prep for an appointment? So their, the patient and the family both to prep for an appointment um, at your memory clinic? I think the, the big thing is to, to have a, a patient come with a family member um, because oftentimes our patients aren't really able to describe what kind of symptoms they have. And if you're trying to do a functional assessment, the family does not, or the family is going to be providing that information, not the patient. Um, I think the um, other thing would be bring an accurate list of medications um, and then most of the time our patients are coming from, you know, a system here in Louisville, Baptist and Norton both use our medical record, but if they're coming from an outside hospital, if there's something specific that their family, their family doctor or primary care physician has done, like maybe an outside MRI, at least to bring the report with them. And then we can call and get any other results we need. So what are your thoughts on the new monoclonal antibody that has come out? <laughs> Well, interestingly, um, there's going to be another one that the FDA will be hearing about in November um, called lecanemab, the one that was um, the one that was um, approved last year. Aducanemab, um, I think, was approved kind of prematurely, um, and that's why it then went forward to um, CMS to see. Um, and then CMS was like, uh, no, we're not going to pay $56,000 a year for every patient unless you are able to provide further study for us to make sure that this medication is going to be of a meaningful benefit. Um, a couple of things to note on the aducanumab is that, um, you know, the two studies that looked at, if, at its effectiveness, one of them was actually stopped early because it was futile. Um, the other thing is that when that when that drug was looking at, when aducanumab, when the, the company was looking at the effect of the drug, it was looking at what does it do to maybe an MMSC score, um, but they didn't have a mark on, or they didn't have a way that they were measuring what's the meaningful outcome for this patient. Because what they're marketing as is, if we can dissolve the amyloid beta protein in the brain, then we should see the dementia improve or get better. But I think 
primary care physicians, specialists, all of us who take care of patients know that the meaningful outcome is really, do we see that their memory is improving day to day? Is that patient um, no longer getting lost driving? Are they able to remember medications again? And aducanumab didn't really have a way to look for that. The other thing with it was that um, a couple of things that we don't know the long-term um, kind of long-term consequences of is that about 20% of patients who took it, um, who took aducanumab had um, microhemorrhages, small bleeding in the brain. Um, they had some cerebral edema or swelling, or they had a radiology finding called aria, which is just an inflammatory reaction from the amyloid beta. Um, and we don't know yet what those long-term outcomes might be. Um, and I think without having that knowledge, um, there's a lot of hesitancy on, I want to make, I want to inform a patient about aducanumab and encourage them to take it, let alone because of the price tag. Um, it would be a little different if we had, it might help, it might not, and it costs $100 for three months versus $56,000 a year is a big, big thing to, to give people. Um, the new monoclonal antibody um, uh, that is going to be looked at by the FDA is called lecanemab. It also is using the target of amyloid beta um, with the idea of this drug can help dissolve the amyloid beta and then show improvement on MMSC scores. Um, their original data that is available to look at, it does look like it has a safer profile as far as less aria or bleeding in the brain, um, but I think it'll, it will be interesting to see how the FDA looks at that. Um, other monoclonal antibodies that are, are being researched are actually looking at the tau protein because there is a, um, um, a very strong suspicion that um, the tau protein and amyloid beta combined are the problem with causing Alzheimer's. And it looks like the tau protein becomes a problem first that then causes the amyloid beta to accumulate. So now the thought is the amyloid beta medicines haven't really the ones that we've seen so far in, in drug trials haven't been successful. What if we target the tau protein to get rid of it? And then as a byproduct, the amyloid beta goes away and that's really what's gonna be helpful for Alzheimer's. So I think that's where more research is going towards that tau protein. So I have a request, we're at time, but we have two questions in the chat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if, okay. If you could potentially type an answer on that, you just have to pull up the, not the chat, sorry, the Q and A, okay. you can pull up the Q and A. Sure. Um, and, and type your, your best answers on that while I'm closing the program, sure. that would be phenomenal. 